Uh, thank you all again. Uh, we've already obviously had quite a program, and I think, you know, I was very excited about this panel, not just because of the people on the panel, but sometimes when, sadly, you put on an event and you're talking about things, current events sometimes match up. And we're seeing an extraordinary events unfold in Iran where women are pouring into the streets um, to protest the ab abuse and oppression that they've experienced at the hands of the Iranian religious police. Um, thankfully, we have a panel that I think can speak directly to a lot of this, as well as the counterpart to that. Um, and we just heard our friend Lisa Monaco talk about um, targeting American citizens in an unprecedented manner. It really is extraordinary. You just witnessed the Deputy Attorney General of the United States, really Merrick Garland, who's an incredible Attorney General, but also Lisa Monaco, um, you know, talking about protecting us. Um, Lisa Monaco does do, uh, spend her morning, noon and night trying to protect us, and I know the, the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Justice Department are doing their best to protect us. We have some real debates, though, about the policy associated with that. Um, I personally um, am troubled by the way this has played out. In one instance, we have security services such as the FBI and the likes of, of Lisa Monaco, who's truly a fine person, Lisa I've known for a long time, doing their best to protect us. In the second instance, we haven't talked about it. This is an informed audience both online and in person. When was the last time we had a discussion that you saw, a rigorous discussion in the press, about a hostile foreign country operating extensively in the United States to kill Americans. There's been absolute silence. And I know our friends in the security services have been intent upon, because it's their way, and they do a great job, the, the Bureau has done an incredible job, to keep things confidential. But let me ask, and I'll throw it out to a broader discussion, and hopefully we'll have this discussion with our incredible panel. What if we had talked about it more? I know I wanted to talk about it since the fall, late summer fall of last year when I was aware of some threats to, um, to colleagues. And I asked myself nearly every night if we had talked about those threats and those threats were better publicized, would there have been better security in Chautauqua, New York, where Salman Rushdie was stabbed? Would there have been a better security? But, and I think it's a legitimate policy discussion, and in no offense, in no way, um, a, a challenge to our security services, which, we're, you know, I, I, I'm not going to buy into all the partisan crap that we put up with in the United States. There are good people in government, and sometimes people that are wrong. And our security services have done an extraordinary job of keeping us safe. But the debate is, how can we prevent these attacks from happening, and what are the, what is the, conse what are the consequences to Iran for these attacks? Now, I think that the consequences shouldn't be if they were successful in killing me. I think the consequences should be, what are the consequences for trying to kill me? It would be better that I didn't die or others didn't die. Generally speaking, I think that that would be a better attack, rationale. But we are so consumed, and the press is so consumed with our own political fights and covering one story at a time, but they couldn't focus on what's happening in the United States. CBS News covered and interviewed Raisi the other day. I have no quarrel with CBS News, fine people. Same interview that was Ahmadi Nejad. But I wish that CBS News and some of the other outlets had covered the threats to Americans. You have distinguished public former public servants here. None of them have seen, I'm about to answer the questions I'm posing to you, so you know, forgive me guys, have seen the persistent systematic targeting of American citizens the way we're seeing out of Iran now. It's always been there before, but this is unprecedented. So we really have a, a two-part discussion. The regime targeting its own people and now targeting Americans. And with me today, I'm going to read, I want to make sure I get the bios right, um, is Dr. Hiva Faizi. Hiva is, um, a, 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 was born in Tehran, and she's the CEO of the Pekin Art Car. She used to work at CENCOM and has a doctorate in Iranian soft power. In many ways, she and Masi, who are close, Masi Ali Najad, who you'll hear from later on, grew up with this, so they can speak in uncertain terms. I'm going to force her out of her comfort zone a little bit in talking about her own personal experiences in Iran. Nathan Sales was an Undersecretary of State uh, during President Obama and is a distinguished diplomat in these areas. He can talk about the ideology and, I think, 
the disconnect. Sometimes we have disconnects between our policy of what we do and what we make sense and what the people, I think, really want. Mitch Sober at the end is, uh, you know, there's nobody more experienced in New York about keeping us safe uh, and, and his career uh, in intelligence here in New York City, which has been the epicenter, by and large, not completely, but of, of, of foreign mischief and foreign targeting in the United States. So it's a really distinguished panel, and I'm really delighted to get into it. The first thing we're going to start with, though, I think we have to start what's happened to Masa, Masa Amini. And, uh, you know, I was talking, we, we do these, these uh, pre-discussions where we talk about it. Sometimes the pre-discussions get so exciting, and, I, you know, I want to convey that, get that into the, into the audience. Kiva, uh, Dr. Fazy, grew up in Tehran until she was 15. The hair that you see right there was never made public until she was 15 years old when she moved here to the United States. Kiva, I don't think, you know, we, we throw around terms like bad hijab like they're going out of style because you know what that means, Iranians know what that means, but I think that that is a foreign concept to Americans and Westerners. Can you do me the favor? Talk, tell, me, tell them, explain to them what your mother used to say to you and your sisters, and what is bad hijab, and what are the consequences, and how has that played out with Masa Amani? Thank you, Ambassador Wallace, for giving me this platform to speak about this very important issue that you all have heard about, about Masa. Uh, but let me first start with, uh, since the establishment of this, the Iranian regime in 1979, that one of the first things they did was that they stripped women of every single right they had fought for up to then. They, women are treated as a second class citizen and the Islamic regime in order to enforce their ideology uh, also in, uh, enforced a strict dress code for women for which Iranian women went to street March of 1979 in, um, in large numbers to protest against uh, the mandatory hijab. And to what you said for me to demonstrate and what it means a bad hijab for what Mahsa suffered and she died within just hours of being in the hands of the regime is basically wearing um, this scarf for, you know, this, this is what they want you to do but just for one strand of your hair showing, one simple strand or a little bit showing from the back, the morality police has the authority to beat you, harass you, force you, push you, pull you by your head into a van, take you. Your family will not know where you are, will not be able to communicate with you. They'll take you and if you resist, you'll just get continue uh, to get beaten. And they sit you in a class to teach you what the improper, uh, the proper way, uh, proper hijab is. So literally for a strand, and as they wish, whether it is this much or this, if they feel that that day the Islamic regime is threatened, and which actually um, Raisi signed an order on August 15 to increase the enforcement of the Islamic uh, dress code. And they can, they can just take you in and uh, sit you through the class. And if you in any way resist, you're beaten. Mahsa fell into, uh, from the head injury she suffered, which the CT scans have been released to show that it was a head injury. She did not have any preconditions to any sort of illness. Within a few hours, she fell into coma and was taken and died within a day. Her mother, did not know where she is till the death. I cannot get this video of her mom uh, screaming, I want my daughter back, I want my daughter. And yes, when I was growing up in Iran, every time we would go out, I have two sisters, so imagine the, the fear that my parents had was that, what, where are you going, what are you doing? The fear of whether they come back, are they gonna be arrested or not? And this is something that Iranian women face every day. The, after Masa's death, what they did, as they always do, they tried to cover it, cover it up, say that she had existing condition, and then they, uh, they forced and threatened uh, Masa's family to bury the body that night when they released, because they didn't want Masa to become an icon for Iranians' women and for them to come out on the street. 
And ironically, that's against the Sharia law. You cannot bury the body after sunset. But they, they were forcing and threatening the family to bury the body. Um, but as brave as Iranian women and Iranian people are, they, they poured out onto the streets from small cities, from small cities, from Kurdistan to big cities, to Rash, north, south of Iran. Everybody came out in protest. And what was different this time what was different is that uh, the movement that is being led by women is being backed up by men. The men are behind a woman right now out on the street. The Iranian young men, the fathers, because they know that it could be their sister, it could be their mother, it could be their daughter, it could be their cousin. It could be anybody. A friend of mine sitting here, he sent me a message two days ago of his cousin being beaten by a neighbor, by a religious neighbor, just because she's a single woman living by herself, and they just, they, they feel the, 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 the religious uh, people feel that they can enforce such a thing on people. And what, and to testament to why this movement is different, in 1979, in March, when Iranian um, poured out on the street, Iranian woman, the, the slogan was, um, I wrote that, um, Mikosham, Mikosham, Anke Baradar Amrakosh. I will kill, I will kill those who are killing my brother. This, just a few days ago, this slogan has changed to I will kill, I will kill those who are killing my sister. So it shows the movement has, has gained a new life, and the women are leading that. And the Iranian regime knows this. Why do they threaten the woman so much? Why do they take the rights away? Because the woman, woman movement in Iran threatens the patriarchal and the Shia religious theocracy nature, which is at the core of this regime. It threatens these two big elements that this regime is based on. And the Islamic regime understands that and fears that. And Iranian women are out there as we're sitting here, as Raisi is allowed into our country here, a country where I came to be able to be myself, he is, he is coming here and Iranian women, under his order, are being um, beaten, harassed, and, and men now, because they're all out on the street. Thank you, Hiva. It, it's incredibly personal to you, and I know to Masi, and we'll be hearing from Masi later on. Nathan, we talked about this early on, uh, about sometimes there's a disconnect um, between people and their leaders in democracy or in any country. We have that in the United States. And I think that we don't under, our leadership doesn't sometimes understand that the, that Iran's religious theocracy is based upon it, the preservation of its enemies and the imposition of this religious uh, law. The moment these elements are taken away, it calls into question the viability of that regime. They will die before they change these ways. Somebody said to me the other day, it will take the women uh, protesting the streets over their hijabs to topple the mullahs. But what we see, Nathan, is we project this Western notion onto what we think we can accomplish with Iranians in Vienna. We compartmentalize. It's as if, Nathan, you and I were talking about buying a house. I'm going to buy your house in some sort of negotiation. And in the other room, um, your family was plotting to kill my family, and we were just sort of negotiating on buying this house. And at the same time, you, that you were killing your neighbors. And I said, it's okay. I want to buy his house. <laughs> right, yeah, you know. Well, sorry. I, I, it was, I had a choice. Mitch is going to talk about bad guys in a minute, but, but it, 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 it's so awful the disconnect that we have and look uh, this might bother some people the people in the administration that are, have been pro jcpoa in, in support of the vienna even if i disagree with them i think are patriots maybe you don't don't agree with that some of them are real patriots they believe it i think they're wrong can you explain that disconnect the compartmentalization compartmentalization got to get that out right between the way we think we can interact and what is existential to this regime? Nobody knows it better than you, Nathan. Yeah, it's a great question, Mark, and uh, thanks for, for convening this panel. Um, 
you know, you can break that down, I think, into two separate questions. Why is Iran doing what it is doing, both at home and abroad? Um, and what should the policy response be to that pattern of threatening behaviors? I, I think Iran is doing this for basically two reasons. Uh, it is a revolutionary regime that uses violence to accomplish its strategic objectives. At home, it wishes to consolidate and preserve and institutionalize the revolution. Uh, women in particular, but any other dissidents um, at home that threaten the theocracy um, are destabilizing and must be dealt with accordingly. And the way they are dealt with under this revolutionary Shia regime is through violence, including up to the point of death. Why is Iran using violence globally? Why is Iran the world's worst state sponsor of terrorism? because the use of violence abroad is a way of spreading the revolution and uh, destabilizing the enemies of the revolution, whether that enemy is the United States or Israel or the Sunni Gulf monarchies. So I wanna suggest that it's, it's a mistake to think of uh, the Iranian nuclear program or the ballistic missile program or the human rights violations or whatever other uh, on the long, long list of malign behaviors from Tehran it's a mistake I wanna to suggest to think of those as separate and distinct from one another, as though we were able to address one and solve that, and, and then leave the others for another day, and moving on to address them in, in, in due time. The regime doesn't see it that way. The, the regime doesn't see the terrorism as separate from the human rights abuses at home. Um, they are all integrated parts of a comprehensive strategy for consolidating, preserving, and advancing the revolution. Um, why do they do it? Because they can get away with it. Or at least, to be more precise, they think they can get away with it. What has been the international community's response to years, indeed decades, of domestic violence uh, perpetrated by the regime against its own citizens? A succession of Western companies that want to sign up and do business and enrich the IRGC in the process to the tune of billions of dollars. How do you think that money is going to be spent? It's not going to be spent building parks and hospitals. Look at what Iran's proxies do with massive amounts of cash, the windfalls they receive. Look at what Hezbollah does with money. Look at what Hamas does with money. Millions and millions and millions of dollars spent on concrete to pay for not schools, not hospitals, but tunnels that could be used to send fighters from Gaza into Israel to kill innocent civilians. That's not an aberration. That is the way the Iranian regime uh, that was the regime. That was prophetic. <laughs> Mitch, you're supposed to be warning us of this kind of stuff, doesn't it? I thought the Iran word was going to be. We should check and see if Raisi's behind there. <laughs> anyway. I, I want to point Let's out it's, things up. <laughs> it's the N that fell, which doesn't stand for Nathan. It stands for nuclear, right? It's, it's, the, so M, that, <laughs> the M on summit can be for Mitch. <laughs> um, I was riffing on something, where was I? Oh yeah, so uh, the, the, the bottom line is that um, any kind of sanctions relief offered to Iran is simply going to reinforce the regime's perception, which has been honed and cultivated over many years, um, that they will not have to pay a price for their behavior. They will not have to pay a price for trying to kill the former U.S. national security advisor. They will not have to pay a price for trying to kidnap American dissidents and then a year later returning to try and finish the job with an AK-47. What's the response? Make them pay a price. Make them pay a diplomatic price. Make them pay an economic price. And I'm still riffing. I'm still riffing, Mark. Is it the planning or the implementation? What is it? Why are we why are we making pay a price for the planning? Right, for the planning. That the a plot to kill an American right. is worthy of punishment. We don't wait until they're successful. We we don't punish them if they're good at it and let them get away with it if they're bad at it or if they're foiled by American intelligence or law enforcement services. And we may have to make them pay a price militarily. I'm tired of seeing rockets launch at American soldiers in Syria and American soldiers in Iraq who were there to fight ISIS. They're not targets. They're there to preserve our gains in the fight against ISIS. And the administration, in my view, owes them a duty of care to put their lives at, if their lives are being put at risk, to respond appropriately and ensure that no American comes home in a flag-draped coffin. Thank you.
thank, Nathan, I apologize, but it, it really is such a disconnect to me that, and I don't think the statements were intentionally, but if you look at the statements out of the administration, it's like, if Iran is successful in harming any American, there will be consequences. I would like it to be a little bit different message. If they continue to plot against Americans, there will be consequences. Mitch, I'm putting you on the spot. Should we be talking about this more? I would, I would love by a show of hands in this audience, how many of you knew about these ongoing threats to Iran a year ago? A year ago. Nobody. This is an educated audience. These threats were out there a year ago. And if we had been talking about them and the press had been covering them, would Salman Rushdie be in the hospital or under care today? And I think that the question for you, Mitch, because you're so experienced in this intel world is, first, two parts. Have we ever seen anything like this from a hostile foreign government plotting the systematic killing and kidnapping and torture of Americans on a large scale basis in the first instance? And then second, should we talk about this more? Because if we did, maybe we would have prevented Salman Rushdie from losing his eye. Great. Mark, thanks so much for having me here today. You know, I think it's a difficult balance that uh, law enforcement and government have to face when they're dealing with a threat. Um, some type of terrorist intelligence threat. You know, oftentimes as the plot is de developing, if you're tracking it, uh, you want to keep, you know, those who know about it to a small circle. And ultimately, you know, when you disrupt the plot, you want to make sure you can follow all the strands of it. Try and understand who was behind it, who financed it, who provided the logistics. Are there any loose ends out there that you may not have scooped up? Because the last thing you want to do is only partially disrupt the plot that can then you know, ultimately blow up in your face, literally. But there is a point where arrests are made, where criminal complaints are filed, uh, where people are arraigned. And when you get to that point, it very much is the moment where that should be brought out into the public domain. Um, we heard a little bit earlier from Lisa Monaco, you know, about the 2011 plot against a Saudi ambassador in a Washington, D.C. restaurant. And, you know, Lisa made the, the point that, you know, that was unacceptable. Well, you know, was it? You know, sure, there was an arrest made, but, you know, what was the price that Iran paid for that plot being connected back to Iran itself? And the administration at the time was clear in making that public, which in other cases necessarily hadn't been the case. So credit for making it public, credit for pointing to position and saying, hey, the return address is Tehran. But again, what was the consequence? And again, from the previous discussion, you can draw a straight line from 2011 in Washington and the restaurant plot to you know, where we are today and the abduction and assassination plots, of course, you can draw the straight line. The straight line is, is why would Iran possibly be deterred from trying to attempt additional assassination attempts, additional abduction attempts? And that's really what we're talking about. In the 40 years uh, plus that Iran, uh, this regime has been in place, whether it's Western Europe, Latin America, you know, we've seen three or four different types of plots. There's assassinations, there are abductions, and there are bombings. And who are the targets? Generally, the targets, number one, it's dissidents, Iranian dissidents. We saw that here in New York and Brooklyn. Um, number two, Jews and Israelis, and the regime doesn't make a distinction between the two. And number three, diplomats. And, you know, you can see all of those different